on the BBC World Service in association with ABC and All India Radio. This is Stumped. Hello and welcome to Stumped, your intercontinental hit of news, features and debate from the quirky world of cricket. I'm Alison Mitchell and I'm in Northamptonshire in England, where, well, the ECB, the England Cricket Board, now need a new chief executive Alongside a whole host of other appointments they've made recently, they have just got a white ball coach secured from the international women's game, which is a very interesting development. And I won't be here next week because I'm going to be off to commentate on the French Open tennis, but I'm sure you will be put in excellent hands nevertheless. I'm Brett Spree here at the ABC in Sydney, where it's been a sombre week since learning of the tragic and sudden passing of Andrew Simons, which I know we'll talk about later on. But on the field, next summer is taking shape. It sounds like Cricket Australia wants to start its one-day internationals earlier in the day and finish before night time to allocate more broadcast time to the Big Bash. Whether such a move is able to revive that competition, time will tell. But I'm liking the fact that we won't have these 50-over games finishing so close to midnight because nobody wants that, do they? Well, it does happen in India all the time with the IPL. Hi, I'm Shadrush Sharma, <laughs> once again in Bangalore, where it just can't stop raining. There's some pre-monsoon madness and everything is flooded, including our basement, by the way. So we have some midnight drama trying to get our cars away from there. But it uh, looks like you know, we have to deal with another tragedy in the world of cricket. You know, terrible about um, Andrew Simons. And of course, uh, English cricket, I don't know, Alison, just can't seem to get its act together. What's going on here? Let's hope they can get their act together in time for that first test match because that squad came out as well this week. Some interesting names, a lot of people saying, you know, there's a bit of same, same going on, but we'll have time to talk about that in the show as well, of course, reflect upon Andrew Simons because that's just a too shocking news and so soon off the back of Shane Warne as well and Rod Marsh even before that. To start the show this week on Stumped, we are delighted that we have got a very special guest with us. This is carved away and it's going to be his hundred. And what a fabulous knock. Well batted Ross Taylor. See how he goes in round the wicket to Stokes who is caught at slip. Taylor has taken the catch. Taylor chases and swats the ball away. And that is 250 to Ross Taylor. Taylor is to 50. Another half century for Ross Taylor. Ross Taylor slogs this away. Six runs just. Oh, and the bloke's caught it in one of those shirts. And he's caught $50,000. Taylor repeats the shot again, hits it high into that square leg area for another six. And Ross Taylor reaches another 100 for New Zealand. Well, look, if the legend that is Sachin Tendulkar describes you as an inspiration for all the young kids aspiring to be cricketers, you know you've made a pretty big impact. He has scored more test runs, more ODI runs, more ODI hundreds, more overall hundreds than any other batter in New Zealand's history. He's recently retired after a long and distinguished international career. It is the ex-captain and now former New Zealand bat, Ross Taylor. Ross, welcome to Stumped. How was it listening to some of those highlights? Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I suppose a lot of those were new to me. I guess you're playing in those games, hearing the commentators uh, calling me slogger. Uh, that was interesting. It was probably a fair, uh, a fair comment, but uh, no, some <laughs> positive memories. And it doesn't feel like I've retired just yet, but I'm sure once the team you know, are warming up and getting ready for that test at Lords in, in a couple of weeks' time, uh, I'm sure we'll hit home a little bit more than it has uh, in the last couple of months anyway. I mentioned that Sachin Tendulkar tweet uh, you replied to him in Hindi didn't you at the time which was a, a nice touch the session's been an inspiration to a lot of players and, and young kids growing up and and I was no different um, he was one of my favorite players along with Mark Wall growing up so to have played against him a few times and, and to obviously have got that message uh, is something I'll never forget and we know you announced your international retirement back in December but it was only last month when you, you played your your last game and we spoke to you on stump what was it two years ago to mark your 100th test match and 100 international appearances across all three formats as well which does speak you know volumes about the longevity of your career over those 16 years and you said at the time you know the, the, the R word was cropping up but former players advised you you know that you are a long time retired so having played until the age of 38, what then made you decide that, you know, now was the time to stop? I think you, everyone talks about the right time. If you go on a little bit longer, I probably would have had to have committed to play the next World Cup. And it just gives the next bunch of guys a few more opportunities to play. COVID probably put a, a halt to that. It was um, pretty disjointed. It was, with, you know, everyone in, in all parts of the world were affected in different ways. And, you know, when you're getting older and, and not being able to play as often, it probably... Um, you know, made me retire a little bit earlier than I probably would have liked. But uh, no, I'm really comfortable with my decision. 
Ross, going back to the start then, tell us about your first involvement in sport and how important that was for you growing up. I grew up in a little place called Masterton, just north of Wellington, and a country town that you just grew up playing everything, rugby, basketball, volleyball, netball. You're just encouraged to play it. And when you're a little bit better than most in a small place, you get um, put on a pedestal pretty early and, and you end up playing with kids, uh, I guess, a, a lot older than you. That makes you a better. So I think, you know, that probably culminated in, um, you know, I, I was a very good hockey player and, and probably at 15 or 16 had to decide which way to go. But, uh, you know, growing up in a rural area in New Zealand and playing with kids older than me and having some bigger cousins that were pretty pretty hard on me, um, probably um, helped me out along the way. You came over to England, didn't you, quite a young age and had a very formative experience at Lords. It seems quite fitting as we're talking to you only a couple, you know, a week or so before New Zealand will take on England at Lords. But tell us about that. It's not there anymore. New Zealand Cricket used to have a scholarship to uh, the MCC to be on the ground staff, to be a YC for six months. It's a young cricketer. So uh, I didn't really know much about Lords, to be fair. I heard about the slope and but coming from a population of 20,000 to the population of London uh, was definitely an eye-opener. Um, but no, it was, a, it was a good baptism of fire to really pursue the career that I wanted to, um, to live and breathe cricket, to play at Lords, you know, inspired me to want to come back here and um, probably play county cricket and hopefully one day for New Zealand. So um, I was able to tick off a lot of those goals. I uh, wasn't able to get on the honours board, but uh, a few family members have gone through the, the MCC tour over the years and apparently um, my name's come up a few times uh, for hitting the six over the, the members' side, so uh, it couldn't have been all too bad. You know, I was actually absolutely. on one of those tours just yesterday, Roscoe, and your name did come up. You're absolutely <laughs> oh, right. So, so they are right? <laughs> still mil- milking it, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, just, uh, I, obviously there's not many stories to tell, but um, I thought my family were just making it up. So <laughs> no, I'm glad that someone could, um, actually, um, can actually say that. And your rise to the captaincy did happen pretty quickly, of course. 2010, you had your first taste of the, the national captaincy. Talk us through that and, and I guess how you coped with that responsibility uh, of that uh, role initially. I got it by default a little bit. I was vice captain. McCallum and uh, Vittori uh, were on maternity leave. Yeah, it was it was a strange one having to captain players that are older than you um, and significantly older than you. Um, I'm, I'm hearts for some on, and you always re- told to respect your elders, and it was it was really hard. To, I found it really hard to tell older people who were in some cases a decade older than you um, what to do. Um, but no, I, I enjoyed the challenge. I thought it brought the best out of my batting. But yeah, I suppose. It was, good, it was good fun, um, had some good results. But, yeah, I guess history will, will probably say something different. Well, I'm not so sure. Well, I mean, history remembers you very fondly, Ross. Uh, hi, this is Chaudhry Sharma from Bangalore. Can I take you back to 2008? It was a very special year for all of us because that's when the IPL started. And it was wonderful to welcome you to RCB that year. Uh, give us some of your early memories. Uh, when I was picked up by Bangalore in the second auction, I was just ecstatic to go over. I, no one really knew what to expect. I didn't play in that first game. Uh, I can remember Martin Crowe said to me, Brendan McCullum was on the Red Bulls. He said, he's either going to get a duck or 80. I mean, Brendan ended up <laughs> getting 158, which probably probably helped us out. But for me, being a youngster, sharing a dressing room with guys I'd watched on TV, Dravid, Kumble, Callis, Boucher, guys that were, were legends of the game. I, I think that helped my cricket, and I think it helped um, New Zealand cricket. I think it, it broke down the walls, the aura that these people had. But no, I think the way Brendan batted in that first game of the tournament set the tournament alight, but also gave me an opportunity. I probably wouldn't have played the second game if Brendan hadn't scored 150. <laughs> we bet Mumbai, Sashin wasn't playing, but um, at the old one Kitty Stadium, um, I can remember hitting Harbajan for a couple of sixes. I didn't know which way the ball was going, so I just slogged them. Um, a couple <laughs> came out of the middle um, and, and one landed on the roof. So um, Looking back on it, obviously, once you're retired, you, you have fond memories. But at the same time, you, you know, it's pretty naive and pretty raw back then. And it probably wasn't a bad thing. And of course, uh, I mean, we would seem to think that that's a high point in your career. But would you consider it so? Winning the World Test Championships, the first one, always special? Yeah, I think so. I think to win the inaugural one, people keep telling me, why do you mention it? But um, after the heartbreak of 2019... Um, I never thought I'd say I wasn't going to mention it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's why I I might as well bring it up because it normally always comes up anyway. Um, You know, to have got to come so close, um, it was a fantastic final at the home of cricket. Um, You know, you're flying back home um, with all the emotions of the game and the what ifs. Um, You you also think, oh, that's probably my last chance of, of playing in a World Cup, playing in a World Cup final. To two years later, being in the same country. 
um, obviously different opposition, but um, in a different format. And then being there at the end with Kane um, and hitting the world, uh, hitting the winning runs, uh, I couldn't have scripted it any better. Still get goosebumps thinking about it now. Did that help almost to inform your decision to retire in that it sort of atoned for that World Cup final, but, you know, leaves you with an enormous sense of fulfilment? Yeah, I think so. I think it's nice to to finish. I think as a kid growing up, you always want to be a world champion, um, whether it's realistic. If you'd have told me back in 2006, six, seven that you'd become a world champion with New Zealand, you know, we're always, uh, we always played well at tournaments, uh, but we just weren't quite good enough. So towards those last few years to make finals, I think that was a big plus, but to, to finally get over across the hoop, across the line, um, I don't know if it made the decision easy. I think you, when you've done something for so long, it's always quite tough, but it definitely made the loss of 2019 a, a lot easier to take. So the Test Series about to start, England versus New Zealand. What did you make of the appointments of Brendan McCullum to the England Test team? And obviously your, your relationship had its ups and downs throughout the year. I'm interested, did, did you sort of exchange messages at the moment? Has he, has he had any message from you or vice versa? Yeah, I sent him a message um, once he got it to congratulate him. Two weeks ago, if you had told me Brendan was going to coach England, I would have said no chance. Um, <laughs> what I, and then, then to have to coach the white, white ball team, I probably would have said, oh, maybe. Uh, but the test team, um, it's a complete surprise to a lot of New Zealanders. Um, but, you know, it's no surprise that he interviewed well. You know, I, I think his combination with Stokes is going to be, you know, that's going to be a, an interesting one. They'll be, you know, very attacking and no, I'm just excited to see see how they go. I think uh, the added dimension with Baz being the being the coach. Um, if there's any person in, that knows our team um, the best, it's going to be Baz. So I'm sure he's going to be passing on some inside information. I'm sure that first morning of that test, and when they do see each other, it's going to be a bit strange for everyone. But um, I think uh, he's he's going to do a, a you know a fantastic role, and I look forward to seeing um, how him and Stokes and, and the rest of the team uh, develop over the years. Well, we wish you certainly a lot of peace and enjoyment. Congratulations on your international career, Ross, and we've really enjoyed chatting to you about it here on Stumped. Thank you. Thanks for having me. From the BBC World Service, this is Stumped on All India Radio. Next on Stumped, England's men's cricketers might not have played a match for a couple of months, but goodness me, it has been a busy time off the field. They've got a new test captain in Ben Stokes, new test coach, as we've been speaking about, in Brendan McCullum. And there's been even more this week. Tom Harrison resigned as chief executive. James Anderson and Stuart Broad recalled to the test squad for uh, these first matches against New Zealand. And there's now been the appointment of the new white ball coach, which is Australia's highly successful women's coach, Matthew Mott, on a four-year deal. Brett, has that come as a bit of a shock to Australians to lose Matthew Mott? (laughs) <laughs> yes, because England's gain is certainly Australia's loss, Ali. So personally, yeah, I've been lucky enough to work with Modi on our ABC coverage of WBBL, where his unique insights as national coach have been tremendous. And he's just a really lovely bloke. Um, I'm happy for him. Obviously, he's a popular coach, very team first driven, very open to the evolution of the game and certain game plans, which are always, a, I guess, a cornerstone of white ball, particularly T20 cricket. So he would already have an idea of what sort of brand of cricket he wants this England team to play and indeed who should be a part of its best 11. Uh, he presided over three World Cup wins, three Ashes, that run of 26 straight one day international wins, of course, for the Aussie women as well. And let's not forget, he has some previous coaching experience in the UK. He was in charge of Glamorgan um, some years ago before the Australian gig. He also won a Sheffield Shield with New South Wales before that here in Australia. But it's such a different scenario, Ali, I guess, to the test side of things, where there's a bit of a rebuild happening. England is already reasonably successful as the defending 50-over champions, currently ranked second, also ranked second in T20s. Of course, interestingly, Matthew Mott's first big assignment in charge will be the T20 World Cup later this year in his home country. That's a a great place to start. But yeah, a bit of a shock, but uh, certainly well-deserved. As regards the administration, Claire Connor steps up as interim CEO for the ECB. So that's quite a significant move as well. She's the busiest woman in world cricket with her ICC role. I think her ECB women's role, she will step back a bit you know, from that in order to take on the, the, the CEO role in the interim period. But I would not be surprised at all if she put her hat in the ring for that role full time and she would be absolutely qualified to step up. Brett, I did want to turn to the very sad news from Australia, more tragic news with the loss of Andrew Simons, who was oh, just a, a, another dynamic cricketer in his day who had become popular 
you know, behind the mic doing some commentary as well in recent years too. He's only 46 years old. Just tell us about the response down under. Yeah, it's been, as you can imagine, uh, extremely deeply felt, um, given the other recent losses, in particular Shane Warne from the same era. Look, Andrew Simons typified Australian laconicism. Uh, he could smack the ball around. He bowled spin. He bowled pace. He was a world-class fielder. Before we truly came to appreciate world-class fielders, he loved a beer, which is always endearing to the Australian public, but perhaps not so to the Cricket Australia hierarchy at times. But Aussie cricket fans remember Andrew Simons so fondly. Certainly Queenslanders do. I was up in Queensland when the news broke and there were 40,000 fans at a rugby league match I was at that observed a pure moment silence. The respect was always there for him. And I just feel for his family, obviously, and his children are only mm. still quite young, primary school age. But again, it's a loss that the cricket community will will feel together. Yeah, well, I, you know, I've heard Harbhajan Singh particularly uh, recall some fond memories later on when they came to be colleagues, and I think all of India particularly appreciated his enormous skill, his his genius really with the bat, and he was a pretty handy bowler as well. And Brett, you mentioned his fielding, so an all round cricketer, you know, one of the best in the world. It's truly tragic. Yeah, he'd only been passing comment hadn't he, at Shane Warne's funeral that Shane Warne was gone far too young and then so soon after 46 years of age uh, a car crash yeah e extremely sad news Andrew Simons played for Australia for over a decade across all formats two World Cups 250 over World Cups of course that he helped them to win is his brilliance in, in the, the the white ball game was and you're right Charlie that that word sort of genius he had a he had a special touch well, that is it for Stumped this week on All India Radio. Don't forget you can follow us on Twitter. We're at BBC WS Sport and use the hashtag BBC Stumped. And check us out on YouTube as well. Go to the BBC World Services YouTube channel. My thanks to Chari Sharma and to Brett Sprigg and, of course, to our special guest, Ross Taylor. And to you for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Stumped is a BBC Sport production for the BBC World Service in association with the Australian Broadcasting Corporation and All India Radio.